Welcome everybody. It's so great to see people in person. <laughs> we have a little bit of business to transact before we uh, welcome our speaker. So next slide, please. <laughs> we'll introduce Simon. Judy, will you be introducing Simon? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Judy will be introducing Simon Thompson, who will speak with us tonight about warblers. And next. Uh, this April, in about six or seven weeks, our chapter is hosting the North Carolina. Audubon Summit will have people coming from chapters from all over the state and staying in Charlotte. And got a few things I'd like to talk to you about uh, for that. The conference is going to be uh, headquartered at the UNC Charlotte Marriott Hotel and Conference Center. It's on Highway 29 at UNCC. And on Friday, the 22nd of April, there'll be workshops all day. You'll be able to sign in that day. And when you sign in, you'll get a bag full of fabulous prizes, <laughs> including a beer mug from uh, Burson Brewery. Um, lunch, oh yes, the, the bag itself is an insulated bag. You can take your lunch into the field. Uh, we have wild bird seeds. So there'll be all kinds of good stuff in there. And in there, there'll be a ticket. And this ticket is to the Friday night reception that's gonna be held at the Armory Cow Brewery. It's a 15 minute walk from the Hotel Conference Center, a five minute drive from the Hotel Conference Center. And we'll have uh, catered appetizers. There'll be food trucks, there'll be gluten free and vegan. And in your bag, there'll be a ticket for one drink of your uh, choice at the brewery. On Saturday, we have bird walks going all day. We have a set in the morning, a set in the afternoon, so people could uh, uh, go to two different bird walks on Saturday. On Saturday night, there is another reception and a dinner, and that's being run by NC Audubon. And on Sunday morning, there are more bird walks, and these some of these are a little further out of town where people on their way home can uh, take a bird walk. We also need volunteers. We really need volunteers. And over here, you can scan this QR code and get into an app that will allow you to sign up for volunteers and sign up for specific what? camera. Camera. <laughs> you can sign up for specific <laughs> jobs at the uh, at the summit with this. You can also sign up from our webpage, right? By tomorrow. By tomorrow. Not that. And we need people to work the registration slash information table to help with field trips so the field trip leader can concentrate on the birds and those people will concentrate on the logistics of getting people where they need to be. We need posts to circulate on for Friday night at the reception and just generally have people around the hotel to take care of problems as they arise. So, and the registration, not to volunteer, but registration for the summit itself is now up and running, right? So next month, April 22nd, 23rd, 24th, okay. Okay, next slide. Here's some photos. Uh, Richard, you want to talk about this one? Um, yeah, no, I don't send out an email except with the server stuff. So basically, go back and push back to the swamp area on the creek. And so, the camera's got a camera that's a big show. And I'm out of the camera. So, a bunch of ducks that hit their email and say, well, that was strange. Uh, okay, so now we have breaks to buy. Oh, no, we just saw it. It's a great one. So, I got a picture. Thank you. Next. Our own CDOC 
Steve, would you like to say what's going on here? Yeah. 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 McCluskey, and that was on a walk that I led last Saturday at Clark's Creek. And what do we have? There's a creek. And here are people walking on a closed trail. We want to see the chorus press. We'll become out that there. Yeah. I think they put it there after we walked on that trail. <laughs> Very nice little. Tom Warbler, and we got terrific looks at uh, Easter Metal Arts. We probably had eight or ten. And there was a, a cedar tree that was full of robins and cedar wax wings, just scarfing down the roots. Okay, April 30th, we're doing our annual spring bird count, and Jeff Lemons is coordinating that. So if you'd like to participate, it's sort of like Chris's bird count. But in the spring, we go all day, sunrise to sunset. And uh, there's certain territories that are covered. And Jeff is looking for people to participate. Our next meeting, uh, Dr. Benjamin Van Doren at Cornell is going to talk to us about migration stories. And the title is from Birdwatcher and Ornithologist. And since he's in New York, this is going to be a Zoom meeting. But it's it's a it's a hybrid. So we will meet here. We will meet. And he'll be on Zoom. He'll be on Zoom. Okay. So it's what they call hybrid. Hybrid <laughs> Zoom. Meeting. Okay, and Richard will tell us about upcoming walks. Thank you. 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 There's the list. Um, there's hopefully we'll add some more to the list. So keep on going back to the website. We'll send out the mailings on Sunday so that you'll have uh, a heads up on what's going on up on that week. We're taking 12 and make sure you let the trip leader know that for some reason you can't make it so that we can fill in those spots. Make sure we have as full as possible. I told Steve I got a little emotional when I thought about it because I was out with Ron the week before last and People are having such a good time. And I think that's a big part of all this. Thank you. And as Richard just said, if you sign up for a walk and find you can't go, let the leader know because we often run wait lists for these walks. Okay, are we now ready for the main event?
Judy. <laughs> um, it's my great, great pleasure. I think he's already left. I don't see it. <laughs> he's already here. Run, run for me. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Simon Thompson, who I have known since uh, for many, many years, at least well back into the 90s. Um, we birded as young and together, I guess is what they want to call us. Um, he is the uh, sole proprietor of the Ventures Birdie, uh, which is out of, Char out of uh, Asheville. There are a number of people here that have been on his, on his trips. The man is an encyclopedia, and you can take him probably just about any world, anywhere in the world and he'll be able to bird and be able to tell you what you're hearing. It is amazing. Uh, I've been to Ecuador with him. I've been all over the place with him. And, you know, I don't know how he remembers, you know, all these birds. But anyway, but he's here today to talk about uh, warblers, which most of us say, ah. <laughs> it's spring, we get excited about them, but we also dread them because they're so hard. And he has left. He did leave. <laughs> he didn't have to. Did I break you up? <laughs> um, you're going to need to speak clearly and loud and try to say in this general vicinity. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Judy, and thank you, everybody. Excuse me, I, yes, I must have just broken up with Judy's wonderful introduction. <laughs> I apologize, I do tend to twitch a little bit, so I'm going to try. Yeah, I twitched for the mountain bluebird as well last week or the week before. But I tend to sort of try and fidget when I'm up here, so I'm going to try and stay a little still. If I see Judy at the back going that way, that way, I'll know that I'm in the wrong place again. But, but thank you, yes. What I've, I've got a little bit of shopkeeping to start with. On the table here, you might like to pass this around. I'm going to do some bribery. I've got a couple of gift certificates to give away. As a friend of mine said, Madagascar? I said, no, 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 no. So you get just an, a book, a day trip, anywhere you like. Well, within reason. But they're usually in Western North Carolina, so there'll be a couple of day trips to give out. I've got a box and there's some sign up cards over there, little bits of paper, and we're going to pass them around. At the end of the evening, we'll find some lucky person to pull the tags out of the box and we'll give away a couple of day trips. So, Judy, if you'd like to get that going, that would be great. Uh, what am I doing? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> so, I was out this morning, it was, I said warm the warm up, we could have had warm the heat up today, it was so warm outside and I was lucky to go out on a nice walk today down on one of the greenways, Lower McAlpine I think it was, and we managed to get three expected warblers today, including a nice, couple of nice orange crowns, one of them was even singing, which was nice. And, um, but we're going to take you this do you remember years ago we got before this was before probably before the internet and before cds and all this stuff we had those audubon vhs tapes and there were about five of them and we all thought they were fabulous to start with and then after a while we put them in and we go oh my god how many warblers are they going to go through and it was one warbler after another after another after another and they were really good at putting you to sleep so I'm going to try to keep people awake and we'll have questions afterwards, shall we, Judy? Whatever yeah. you want. Or actually, we can have them during, if you like, as well. But just as I say to some of the school groups, questions, not comments. So we're going to start with, do I wave at you when we change pictures? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe, yes, technology. 
My partner is a, is a refugee from technology. He left his phone on a train in Madrid. And it was up to me to try and get it back. And I discovered one thing that you, we tend to forget as we get older, that everyone in Europe has WhatsApp. So if you know their name and you search on WhatsApp, you can usually find them. So anyway, technology. You're in charge of technology, are you? Great. What we're going to do is we're going to learn a little bit about resources, ID, and habitat of all these warblers. So go ahead, next one. And things that well, so a lot of us here are probably very familiar with, where, where these birds migrate to and from, where they prefer to nest, and some songs. I am going to challenge you because we have got some songs that we can play. She's looking worried already. We're going to play some songs in a minute, but they're, they're going to be links in the actual program. So, warblers, they are small, they are insectivorous, and they are highly mobile. But there are some great references. You can use it as a doorstop. The Warbler Guide, but it's actually a very good book. There's also an app that goes with it that I've still yet to figure out, but you can rotate warblers and turn them upside down and look at their bellies. Alternatively, you can just go outside and look at them in real life. And Peterson's got a good warbler book. There's plenty of other good field guides out there. And these days, of course, there's everything digital, apps, all About Birds is the Cornell Labs great website. Watching Warblers, is, if you still have a CD player at home, I mean a DVD player, so watching Warblers is terrific. That's done by a couple of folks from Virginia. And that's an excellent little DVD. And if you really want to get, learn your bird songs, the Zeno Canto website is, got, is the repository of bird songs from all over the world. That's a great website. And if any of you, to want more digital resources, if any of you don't use eBird, I would recommend that you don't start now. <laughs> it's a great hole that will just suck you in and you won't be able to do anything. And when eBird goes offline, you won't know what to do. <laughs> this has happened. And I've seen people go, eBird has gone down for 14 hours. What am I going to do with the rest of today? So yeah, don't do eBird unless you have already started. My partner says to me, he says, do you do anything else but eBird? And I go, is there anything else to do <laughs> but eBird? So there are plenty of other apps. Merlin is a great thing from Cornell as well for ID. I did use it the other day as a tip mouse outside my window that was going, <whistles> I held Merlin and it said great horned owl. <laughs> <laughs> so don't rely on these 100%. So, and um, it, it's technology and technology hasn't caught up with, I think the human ear and our ability to identify birds. So let's get on with warblers. So what are warblers? People often will say, I'll ask them what a warbler is, and they'll say some really infuriating little bird that I really don't want to see. So you can have that opinion, but they are. In, in the UK, I saw my first wood warbler actually in England, where they're not supposed to occur. I saw an American red start in England. He had flown across the Atlantic, or probably more likely sat on a boat and gone across the Atlantic. <laughs> And then a few days later, I saw a new northern Perula warbler in England. So, and I think I haven't seen any others. I saw a red-eyed vireo, a petrel sandpiper, so a few other um, American birds. We call them all yanks. <laughs> so we go out to the west of England and we look for yanks. And those are, of course, all the American birds that cross the Atlantic. So warblers, we call them the gems of North American bird life. They're small. They're brightly colored. There are quite a lot of them. We've got about 50, almost 60 species in this country. This is a friend of mine's program, Kevin, who works for me and does amazing trips. He had a thing that said, warblers known for their bright colors and beautiful songs. And I took out the word beautiful and put varied <laughs> because beautiful 
a black and white warbler doesn't have a beautiful song. It sounds like a wheelbarrow that's got a squeak in it. Europe, American warblers are beautiful, no doubt, most of them anyway. Orange crowns are kind of a bit blah, but, and they, but they really can't sing. European warblers are really dull, but they can sing. And some of them have fantastic songs, but they all look the same. So the song is the only way to tell them apart. So the next one, Judy. We have about 40 species, and I'm sure several of you in this room have seen all 40 species in North Carolina. I think all 40 species have actually been recorded in Jackson Park in Hendersonville is pretty darn good place to go in the fall. We have about 23 regularly occurring in Western Carolina. As I said earlier, highly active. They don't sit still. And pretty well, most of them are insectivorous. Okay. And other things that we've already said, variety of habitats, highly migratory and varied songs. Okay, you all know what that is on the right. Female red star, yeah. So we're going to go through breeding birds and then we're going to go after that with some migrants and some winter birds. Let's go ahead. We're going to start by early arrivals. So Northern Perula, and there's a big blue one parked in John and Chris Hanna's driveway. That's actually the license plate of my car, which is Perula. <laughs> so I wanted a bird name that bird watchers would know, but the general public wouldn't. Which is kind of birding arrogance, I think. <laughs> the one upmanship. So anyway, I mine is Perula. So if you so most people wouldn't know even know what it was. But um, the other a couple of years ago I was up at the the um, biggest week in Ohio, the biggest birding week, and there was a car in his license plate was Warbler. And I thought, oh, I have to park next to that. <laughs> so it was Perula Warbler and in two cars, both Subarus, I do have to add. <laughs> first, first one that we usually get in our, our spring arrivals will be the Northern Perula. And it's what we call, a, it's not really a super tropical bird. It doesn't go a long way south. It tends to go sort of halfway. So if you went to Florida in the winter, you'd probably see one or two of them. If you went to Mexico, you'd see a lot. And then the Caribbean, a few. But if you went to South America, <clears throat> no, they don't really get that far. It's small, little white, light yellow fellow. White wing bars are usually pretty obvious. And there's a young one on the right. And it's one of the smallest of the warblers. They nest in... Spanish moss, often high in white pine trees up in the mountains or in sycamores, and their song, which is going to be on the next one, a friend of mine calls it the zipper bird because it goes zip, and see if this works. There we are. Technology when it works is wonderful. What? Red Iberia. There we are. Sometimes I go, zzz, 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 zzz. but this one is just doing the straight old zipper. Great. And again, it's not somewhat, it's not a wall where you really can say, oh, I have to go to a particular habitat. It's really one that you can see. Just about uh, kill it quickly. <laughs> next one again, next early arrival bird is the Louisiana, Louisiana water crow. We've got some resonance now. Another early bird, it'll be here probably, what are we, March? It'll be here this month. The first ones will appear in the mountain streams. And in the spring, I always find a lot of these birds, you don't find them on migration. You find them immediately where they're going to breed. So if you, I don't tend to go to a park or anywhere to look for these. I go straight up into the mountains to Bent Creek near the Arboretum in Asheville, and there'll be a Louisiana water thrush 
on the river already. It's very similar to the other one, the Northern Water Thrush, but he won't be through quite yet. <laughs> There's a great way to tell the two apart. And I can say this. Um, with Louisiana, imagine you're a, Louis, a drag queen from New Orleans. Drag queens have long pink stockings and they sachet. That is a Louisiana water thrush. <laughs> now you won't forget that now, you'll get it. Next Louisiana water thrush, you'll see that. Really? <laughs> we'll think of you. You'll think of me. I, I'm not a drag queen though. I have, no, I won't tell you anymore. But Louisiana water thrush, it's a warbler, not a thrush, obviously, and eats aquatic insects, sort of the Euro Eastern version of a dipper, sort of. And it sounds like. One more time. Good. Three big sliding notes and then it sort of disintegrates and sort of falls away into the background. But it's loud enough that it can be heard over rushing water. So that's, he'll be, so first we get it at Perula and then in a, probably by a couple of weeks time, the first water thrush will be in. Similar to um, other species, the Northern water thrush, which tends to be a little bit more sedate. It's not quite as flamboyant as Louisiana. It's just a little bit, it's a Northerner. They're not as flamboyant. <laughs> and um, again, we'll, when we see the Northern in a few minutes, we'll be able to see it's a little, little more sedate. Another one that'll arrive within the next few weeks is probably my favorite of the lot. This is yellow-throated, not to be confused with the yellow throat, which is a, another warbler, but completely different. Again, doesn't go all the way south. Um, I was in Panama a few years ago and I said to the local guide, oh, there's a yellow-throated warbler up in that tree. And he said, oh, where? I've never seen one. So they don't usually get as far as Panama. That's just a little bit too far. But uh, again, it's a Spanish moss bird up in the mountains, white pines, again, like the Peru. They're, they're often in the same habitats. And it has a very long bill. I'm not, obviously, for its habit, for its food, it tends to find food maybe among pine needles, amongst the, the Spanish moss, but it's a very long billed bird. Similar to a few others, some of these are Western species, but this with his bright yellow throat and the black and white, it's, I think when there are a lot of very colorful birds out there, but when you have a bird that's two colors set off by a third, that's, I think, a little bit more dramatic, as opposed to a painted bunting, which is just over the top. <laughs> <laughs> and the yellow-throated sounds like, I think we've got him on the next picture. Maybe we didn't, did we? Oh, there's the yellow-throated. Those little things hide, don't they? Descending with... Sounds like frogs. Okay, good. Okay, now I've been put, I can't say anything while it's playing. Okay, good. Slight descending notes and then the last one flips up again. Last one goes up. Easy song, it'll be, I'll probably hear the first one again before the end of March. So, and yes, it says here the true palm warbler. These actually like palm trees. So this one should be called a palm warbler, <laughs> as there are actually lots of warblers with yellow throats. So I think maybe we should start renaming them all. That gets into another complete kettle of fish. Okay, Judy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> then we have the prothonotary warbler, but that's. That's another beast. Oh. 
<laughs> you sure you want to record this? <laughs> That's like <laughs> black throated green. Again, it'll be back before the end of the month. Places like Chimney Rock Park, cove forests, lots of mixed hardwood and uh, conifers. It's a bird that's really a northern species. So if you have your warbler books or field guides, look at the range maps and they come down the spine of the Appalachians. It's very easy bird to identify. No other warbler has that bright yellow face. And he is one that tends to go down into Central and Southern America. Female is a little different, sort of a shadow of him. Um, and I hadn't heard this. A friend of mine said, he said, I am black and green is what he said. Some people go trees, trees, murmuring trees, or a bit of Beethoven that's gone slightly wrong, but um, let's play him. We may have to skip some of these ones. Then, right? That's a when, one more time. That one sort of has a different version. But they're all, you can put words to these. And some people say, like I said, trees, trees, murmuring trees. But I am black and green, I am black and green, sort of works as well. So when you put birds to bird songs, you can be as creative as you like. We all know the Eastern Meadowlark goes, I think spring is here. I think spring is here. And the Western Meadowlark goes, I don't want to be a Meadowlark. <laughs> it helps you remember it. However silly, it doesn't matter. So again, it's got some sort of relatives out west of the Golden Cheek, Townsend's Warbler, Hermit Warbler, but we won't really get those around here. And it's a bird that you go out on, in the mountains, go hiking, you will hear black-throated green warblers. They really are quite common. Another one with a silly name. Again, it's an early one. It'll be in probably first week or so in April goes down into the Caribbean, and, excuse me, Central America. It's a drabish bird. They're not really as yellow as this picture. They're sort of a honey brown, and he's set off with these nice black and tan head stripes. But sexes look the same. It's mostly caterpillars, as do a lot of them. But I guess when they named this one, who knows what they were thinking. But um, <laughs> it does nest on the ground, and. If you, it's a bird that a lot of people still haven't managed to get good views of. The trail to the waterfall at Chimney Rock Park, you almost have to kick them out of the way. They are quite common on that trail, but you need to know the song, otherwise you won't know they're there. We're gonna try this one again. It sounds like, sounds like a worm eating, worm eating warbler sounds like a junco, sounds like a swamp sparrow, sounds like a chipping sparrow, pine warbler, all of these things trill, but they're all found usually in different habitats. So that's often a clue is if you think it's a pine warbler and you're surrounded by pine trees, it's pretty likely to be a pine warbler. It could, if it's a swamp sparrow, it would probably be in a wet habitat and Worm-eating warblers like rocky slopes with deciduous vegetation. So you won't find one in a swamp singing. It will be a swamp sparrow. So habitat for a lot of these birds, especially when they're on territory, is pretty important. Okay. Another one that will be, it's early, before the end of April, actually probably a couple of before the end of March. One that we're all familiar with, black and white. <laughs> So, what's that? I said some never left. So, really? You have them all winter? Yeah, we yes. actually had a yellow bush. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of this stuff happening in the next few years. But um, a black and white warbler turned up in England once. It turned up in Norfolk. 
in the east of England, one January day. I bet that person was surprised. <laughs> but um, it, people still to this day go and put offerings at the base of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I miss the black and white world, but will one ever come back? <laughs> Probably not. But um, this little stripy fellow goes up and down the tree trunks like a little mini nuthatch or woodpecker. And winters, as you see some around here, I saw some in Florida in, in the winter. And this is the one with the squeaky wheel sound that I don't think you could describe as beautiful. It has another, it has some call notes as well, which it will roll in sometimes with the song, and they sound like a typewriter. I can say a typewriter to you people because I know you'll know what one is. <laughs> I say this to somebody recently and they looked at me blankly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're under 30, you don't know what a typewriter is. And so it makes this tick, 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 tick sound. <clears throat> well, somebody who's good at typing, not me. But, um, so these are some of the early arrivals that are going to be coming through within the next probably month. And after that, we'll get common yellow you know, Have one of those all winter or not? Sometimes, sometimes. sometimes. I had one in Asheville last winter that was hanging around up there. And unlike the yellow-throated, which we saw a few minutes ago, yellow throat has this little black bandito mask and tends to be a bird of low, wet, brushy thickets. And it is common. And you hear them. Sometimes they can be annoying to, to get out, but um, with a bit of encouragement, squeak at them a little bit. They often will, the male will pop up or maybe work his way up a branch to come sing and then look at you. And the female is, which I think is the next slide, looks a little bit, she's a little bit, that might even be a young male actually with a slightly dusky face, but, um, this is the one that does the classic witchity, 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 witchity song, which we're going to try. Trying to get. We'll let them do for. Two, I think. A few years ago, I was just wondering what was in the background. I was listening to what was singing behind as well. There was a very singing behind that. Years ago, I went to Peru, my first ever trip, and I was you know, gung ho and keen, and I was recording some birds. And I came back and I spoke to a, a guy who was very experienced. I said, Is this a so and so? And he said, Yeah, that is, but listen to what's in the background. And he started naming all these things that I had never even heard of, let alone seen. So it's always fun to record and see what else you've recorded at the same time. So going on to the other species, this is the next, what we call the next wave. Once the black and whites and the yellow throated and the Louisiana water thrushes have all come in, we get what we call the second wave. And these are birds that have gone often as far as South America. If you go to Colombia, which is a wonderful place, Blackburnian warblers are really common. They are everywhere. We saw them every single day, even in city parks, there are Blackburnian warblers. And it's, a, it's not an uncommon migrant here in, in spring and again in the fall, but it tends to breed higher up in the mountains, places around the Park Blueish Parkway, Brevard, they're quite common. And um, these come through with other species, which I'm going to show in a minute, but, um, this is your classic black and white bird, third color, like you've dipped into, into orange fluorescent paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the southernmost breeding is probably way down the Blue Ridge into maybe northern Georgia or something like that. It's males and females, quite different. They've still got the, the sort of complicated black and, black and colored head pattern. And the song is, it's very high pitched. It's one of those birds that, after you get to a certain age, you say, well, I see them open their bills and they say something, but I don't hear anything come out. 
And so the chances of you hearing this may be slim, but let's give it a go. We'll give it a couple of shots. Did anyone hear that? Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's either does the, the slow stairs, a bit like a black and white warbler that's climbing some stairs. Then it just goes up. So it's a very high pitched. And of course, then the bird's in the top of the tallest tree. And, but you can get up to the Blue Ridge before the end of April, before the leaves have started to fill out. And you should see them, but they'll be you know, hopping around, but there won't be any leaves, which is really helpful. So another one that won't be probably the first, second week in April, a hooded warbler comes back. This one is lower and much easier to see. This is the one that nests in my back garden. I've had him on the porch. I've had him on sitting on the chairs. His male is really brightly colored and with a big yellow face. Then he goes really as far as Central America. Female looks a bit, little bit of a sh like shadow of him, but they've got this white tail, white tail feathers that they flash like this all the time. So it's often a bird of sort of thick understory and song again. See, I want to read, rent a video. Of course, videos now are completely obsolete. <laughs> so like typewriters, we're gonna... That's a fast hooded warbler. Some of them, that one goes, normally it's weeta, 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 yo. And I want to rent a video, but again, you put your own words to them and whatever you feel like. But hooded, they're common, especially in the mountains. You probably have them nesting around here in parks and places, do you? Not so, not so much, okay. But um, come up into the mountains, they're way more common. <coughs> And my first North American wood warbler, American red star. Of course, it wasn't an adult male. Adult males are not usually stupid enough to try and fly across the Atlantic. They know better. They've survived a couple of years. So they, they, they know which direction south is. But um, again, it's in some countries, they call it in the tropics, they call it butterfly bird or Christmas bird or Halloween bird because of all the bright colors. But it tends to really only go far south as maybe northern South America. But um, the male, black, black and orange, and the female is the one we had earlier. And they call them yellow starts. Does anyone here know what start means? Why, what does red start mean? <laughs> no? St start is Old English, sturt, and it means tail. So this is a red tail. Um, it's named after the European red star, which is not related, but the early settlers didn't know that. And so they called these little bright colored birds red starts because of the European red star, because they have red in the tail. And so these ones, I think yellow starts are a good name for the females. And in South America, they have ones with white and they call them white starts. Why not? Very active bird, fly catches, flies around, catches insects and um, as soon as they make females come back, they often build these little tiny cup nests in vines. They love vine tangles where they'll build their nests, little fibrous nests. That, and you all, they're very easy to watch them, to building them. Again, something old fashioned. I've got some LPs. I've got an LP of sound songs of North American warblers. One whole side is American Red Star. I think 15 different versions of American Red Star. 
and they all basically are tss, 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 lots of little sip notes and then or with a, sometimes with the emphatic ending sometimes without but it's quite variable but essentially it's a bit like a fast black and white not quite as high pitched as a blackburnian somewhere there in the middle and one that has a really easy song is this one it's prairie warbler of course there aren't many prairies around here another bird that we should call it the low growth warbler or something like that because the cutover area that's starting to grow up you'll get this nice little yellow warbler and, and they squeak in really well you can quietly squeak at one and they'll come right in and just look at you um, really nice little bird winters in the caribbean that's a youngster over there and um its song is a rising this goes up Okay, I'm trying to not talk over the end of it, but it's again, it's a really easy song. Again, it could be quite too high for some of us if we start to lose that high register for us of our hearing, but that or the sometimes they'll slur it together. But again, it's one that will arrive by the mid, -a mid to late April and then disappear. Maybe some winter along the coast and some will go maybe into as far as northern Central America, but not too much further south than that. There's another one. And one that, if anyone's been to Ohio and been to anywhere around the lakes, the yellow warbler, after a while you go, oh God, it's another yellow warbler. <laughs> I mean, they are really common and they are cute. But, you know, after a while, say, yes, it's another yellow warbler, but it's the one that's supposed to say, sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. And after the 15th, you go, yes, you may be sweet, but go somewhere else and be sweet. <laughs> but again, it's a common bird. It's not so common around us here in the, in the southern mountains. And but on migration, they'll come through. And occasionally, even one, one overwintered in Asheville this year and was coming to a suet feeder all winter, which is really bizarre. But um, it's really widespread some even on the Galapagos Islands. So that shows the, a lot of them must have ended up there to eventually establish a population. And female, the song is, is buzzy and this is the one that goes, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Well, sort of anyway, try that one. That one. Well, I think he's, he's, he's <laughs> carrying red winged blackbirds yeah, and there was a common yellow throat and other things in the background there. But um, I, I've read that the yellow warbler, a lot of these small birds get parasitized by brown headed cowbirds. And the yellow warbler, if it finds a cowbird egg in its nest, will just build another layer, blocking off the cowbird egg and then lays more eggs on top. And so um, it's its own sort of defense against them. And that's one of the, the what they call the mangrove race of red yellow warbler, which has an orange head. There are other ones that have orange caps, so it's really quite a variable little bird. Mangrove, yes. Kentucky, another one that arrives back in around about second week in May, third week, no, second week in April, third week in April, towards the end of the month. Not common, but not rare. It's Common if you go to somewhere in the tropics like Costa Rica, that could be quite easy to see. But it's one that sounds like a bit like a Carolina red. He loves deep, dense, dark thickets, and um, it has that sort of rolling song, a bit like a Carolina red that sort of flatten its song out a little bit and extend it. So instead of a 
teeter, 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 sort of, teeter, 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 it's a little sort of flatter and a little more rolly. So we're going to try him. This is the male, he's got the black, the black sideburns. The female is essentially the same, but her sideburns aren't quite as distinct. And see, the song is a little bit like a Carolina Wren, but just a little sort of flatter and it rolls a little bit more. This one was mad at me. I was squeaking at him or doing other things and he just came in and just looked at me as if to say, I know there's another male Kentucky warbler around here somewhere. You're hiding it. So. Again, and you know, some of this stuff I'm just going to let you read and drop when I talk, I mention it. Swainson's warbler, it's actually not a rare bird. It's relatively common. And especially up in the, what we call the Blue Ridge Escarpment, up the mountains here, there are actually lots of them. And places like Chimney Rock Park, it's easy to see. There are lots of them as you cross the Continental Divide going down into Water Lake Lure. Um, tends to winter down in Central America. It is a real horror to try and see properly. And I've had them, but they are really responsive. Often you can not, not necessarily squeak at them. I, occasionally I will use a tape recording. And these birds, a friend of mine said, oh yes, I can take, put it on the car and the bird will be in the back seat before any long, because they are really, really responsive. But um, they have a loud song, a little bit like the Louisiana water thrush, which is, but it just goes whip, 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 whip a will. But it's, um, loud sliding notes and you'll hear 10 and maybe see one or maybe see to hear 20 and maybe see one it's difficult to see but it's you know give it some effort and sometimes you'll end up it's a sort of a yellowy brownish warbler it's big and has a really distinctive heavy chip note as well we're not going to talk about chip notes that's i'll get ron to give you a program on warbler chip notes <laughs> Other birds have strong chip notes as well, but it's another warbler, of course, despite its silly name, it tends to sit, sit, sit up on a high perch in the forest. And if you can find where it's singing, you'll get really good views because they stay there. Once it drops to the forest floor, you're lost. You won't find it sort of disappear amongst all the leaves and ferns and things. But it's, it's a bird that a friend of mine said it's designed by committee. It's this big white eye ring, big pink legs, and this crazy crest that it can raise and lower. And it's got these big pink chicken-like legs. So it's kind of just an oddball. But it is, it's unfortunately oven birds because they migrate at night. This is one of the birds that gets killed the most by windows and telecommunications towers. Not sure quite, maybe it's the elevation that they tend to fly. That's it, just the one. Easy song, loud rhythm, teach, 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 teach. Sometimes they slur, it has some regional dialects as well. So nests on the ground. We're gonna go through these a little bit faster. Okay, next one. You may not play some of them, but um, yeah, we won't play these ones because they don't have very interesting songs anyway. <laughs> But um, golden wing warbler arrives back by the end of April. Nice, brightly colored fellow. And easy to see if you go to certain spots, Max Patch area up in the mountains. Um, Graham County, there are quite a few of them up there. 
I don't, you just flip through them and I'll just say things, okay? How about that? There's another male golden wing. As a buzzy song, a friend of mine said it sounds like a Bronx cheer, and I really didn't know what he was talking about. And it's a, bzz, 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 and that's a golden wing. But um, blue wing is close relative, and again, just an even simpler buzz, double buzz for his song. These ones, warblers are 99.9% .9 of the time, they mate with their own kind, but occasionally they hybridize. And I've always wanted to find a hybrid warbler. The blue wing and the golden wing will hybridize relatively commonly. And that top one is a Brewster's, which is the dominant of the, of the two genetic uh, pairs. And the bottom one is the Lawrence's, which is the more recessive of the two. And these two I both found, which I was quite pleased about, but I'm really looking forward to something like a chestnut-sided warbler crossed with a red star. I think that would be really interesting. So, and cerulean, not so uncommon up around Asheville in the mountains, but overall it's not a particularly common bird. I think up maybe around West Virginia, up into the Ohio Valley, it's a lot more common than it is in our area. It's not a common migrant through either. It tends to be a fairly, you know, it's a long distance bird, flies down Belize, next stop the Andes in South America. Let's play this one though, because this one has a loud song and it tends to be persistent. So if you found a singing male, stick with it, it keeps singing, it keeps singing, and eventually it will show itself. No, that's okay. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so the cerulean tends to make this buzz, 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 buzz. So he tends to be loud. He tends to be persistent. So stick with him. That was the male. The female is a sort of a chartreusey, greeny color. This one was taking spiders' webs out of that nest and then building, putting them in her nest, her own nest, not that couple of nests. So that was taken up on the Blue Ridge. Another common bird up on the Blue Ridge. And it's, if you go to Jamaica or somewhere like that, to Caribbean in the winter, the black-throated blue is a common one. And for some of us that like our ales, this is the beer, 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 please. One. Sort of, sort of beer, 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 please. So you, again, you have to have a sense of imagination or maybe you've had one of those beers to help you sort of learn these birds a little bit more. Female used to be thought of as a separate species, but they both have the little white pocket handkerchief, tend to be low feeding birds. So it's not one that's really up at the tops of the trees. Also very common in that one. I know when I went to Jamaica and did a birding trip, we had them in the bedroom at one stage. <laughs> so they, they, were, they are really common on Jamaica in the winter. And this bird is a triple hybrid warbler, the only one. One was found breeding with a hybrid blue wing golden wing. And it produced this really strange looking yellow and streaky thing. But um, I think that would be pretty cool. It's a pretty attractive bird, chestnut sided, very common in the mountains. And if you go to Costa Rica in the winter, really common in Costa Rica as well. But um, low vegetation, every overlook on the Blue Ridge Parkway has chestnut sided walkers. Very polite. <laughs> I'll tell you why. This one's a fast one. It says, please, please, please to meet you. So, but that one was a bit of a sped up version of it. But they can, that's the common words we can use to describe the song of a chestnut sided warbler. And male, very distinctive. Female, sort of a shadow of him. And in the winter, they tend to be chartreuse green and gray. 
So that's a common bird, especially that. And during full migration, I bet in places that around here, they can be quite common. Another one in the mountains, it's very active, flycatching warbler, somewhere like Panama, Colombia in the winter, they are really common. And again, it's one of the ones that breeding range sneaks down the Appalachians. Long distance migrant, and some of these birds that are long distance migrants tend to have very, very long primary feathers. You can see on this one, it's got quite a long primary feather. Um, one that we had today, pine warbler. Don't need to say much about that one. Nice, rich trill. And the female, quite drab overall, but still kind of a deliberate bird. It tends to work its way through the trees, preening, I mean, feeding and looking. Occasionally, they'll even eat suet and small seeds at the wind in the winter. Right now, yes. And a few that are passing through. These ones don't have any songs, so you don't have to. We're just going to flip through these ones quickly. Wilson's warbler. Spring and fall on its way down to Central America for the winter. Magnolia, another one of my favorites, with probably the song that I can never figure out. It sounds like a half a hooded warbler. And I remember with a, a good some folks once, and I was standing at an overlook, there was one singing below us. And I said, Here's a one magnolia, magnolia warbler it's singing. It's, this is how it's singing, blah, blah, blah. Up pops a chestnut sided warbler, singing a perfect <laughs> magnolia warbler song. They do that intentionally. Palm warblers, migrants coming through. Has a buzzy song like a, an orange crown or a junco. And another one of the high pitched fellows. They arrive at the very end of April, beginning of May. And by the end of August, they're already, some of them are going south. So it's not here for very long. Ditto black pole. They're on there. Common in the spring, very, very uncommon in the fall. And pole, Another one of those, I think another of those old English names means top of the head. So black pole, red pole, all to do with the top of the head. Yeah. And Connecticut's again. Best place to see these, of course, is not Connecticut. It's um, <laughs> northern Michigan, southern Manitoba, all along the Great Lakes up there. It's not uncommon. You go to the right place. There's only a couple. More so then like a, you can go home and be utterly confused. Morning warbler, again, not super easy to see, especially on migration, but um, it's a fairly late bird. It tends to come through towards the end of May. And one that you all love, <laughs> the famous butterbutt. And um, they do get to look very pretty. They get this lovely black and white and yellow, and then they leave. So it's a bit, but if you don't know the chip note, you are doomed. If you want to find any other warbler in the winter, amongst all these yellow rubs, you have to know the yellow rub chip note and you have to sort of fish through them with your ears and you think, aha, orange brown. And you have to pull it out. It's, there are, there's one, a hundred yellow rubs to every other warbler in the winter, if not even more. So anyway, that's, I think, the last war. Yes, it was. You've still got time to study before they get here. Thank you, sir. And you're going to There was another slide, but don't worry. It's okay. Can you go back to it, can you? I was just going to do a, a shameless promotion. Of, well, thank you for my photographer. Alan comes on <coughs> trips and he takes all these fantastic photos and then, then lets me use all of them. So, and uh, Kevin put the program together. So I have to thank him for doing all the work. And I just took out some of his expressions and put in my own, changed color from C O L O R to C O L O U R, <laughs> as it should be spelled. So thanks again, everybody. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. And while you're getting questions, we'll get the box and we'll pull out a, a couple of winners for a gift certificate.
Oh, any more names still need to go in the hat? Any got any questions? Or are you completely, um, I could have gone on for another hour, but. Uh, yeah, yes. Over the years, yes. The mo there's a warbler, there's a trail in Jack Jackson Park, if you don't know, is in Hendersonville. It's a city park. It's got some, lots of really good habitats. There's a walk the second Saturday of every month. There's a trail called the Warbler Trail because I was birding with a friend one day and we had 26 species in one morning on that trail. And the name stuck, which is, but normally you don't get 26 in a, in a morning. And I've, that was, gosh, that was back in, that was a while ago. And I've challenged all these young whippersnapper birders out there, see if you guys can get more than 26. And no one's done it yet. Yes, nothing wrong with a good challenge. So, okay, here's the box. On the table over here is also um, some calendar of, of trips. Also on the website, the Ventures Birding Tours website, is a link to all these bird walks that we've mentioned. Not the dates, but just where you can go to find out when they occur. So. Uh, is that what your business is? is um, sign up for bird walks? I assume that. Oh, you have that, yeah. I should have given you a huge propaganda spiel at the beginning, but I didn't. No, I own a bird watching tour company. I started it ooh, 20 years ago, and it's now completely and totally insane, is one word. <laughs> the next eight trips are full. Uh, and it hasn't stopped. It's just, I put a trip up and within the next week, it's full. So it's just great. No complaints. Yes, sir. Approximately 70% of the birds in our woodlands, I believe, are migratory. So that includes all your real, yeah. And then I'm going to pare it down to that. I'm just trying to think backwards. Um, gosh. 30%? Less than that, 25%? It's a lot. It's a lot. And during migration, it will be a lot of birds. So if you hit a good migration day, it can be completely mad with, with the numbers of individuals, especially in the fall. The spring is not really as impressive because the birds are on their way to breed. But in the fall, when they're slowly drifting south, I've seen a good day with 50 red stars, 100 magnolia warblers, all in one place. So, and they will be vastly the majority of the birds that are moving through will be the warblers. Okay, I need a victim. How about you, Sharon? Well, you can pull out one. Thank you. And Judy can pull out one. I've... I'll put my glasses on. There's a green bag at the end of the table. That has... no, my glasses are in here. But there's a, in that green bag are two gift certificates. I didn't put them on the table because I didn't want somebody to steal them. <laughs> are you allowed to pull out your own name? Judy, uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you one anyway, but I'm going to keep that for later. You can pull out another one. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I know one person. I don't know the other person. So. Okay. This is well, camera, this one is camera, for camera. Oh, camera, camera, camera. Okay. Okay. Gift certificates for a ventures day trip worth sixty bucks. Doesn't include lunch. You have to bring your own. And this one is to Mary Claire Wall. <laughs> The other one is to somebody who's been on a trip before. This is to Jack. Where's Jack? Jack Meckler. There we go. Oh, 
Well, thank you, folks. Um, there's lots of good day trips coming up. There's one to see woodcocks and whippoorwills. There's warbler ones. There's gobs of things going on. But you've got lots of gobs of things going on around here as well. So if you get distracted and want to come to Asheville for the <laughs> just have a look at the website. If you haven't got the website, it's, there's plenty of stuff on the table over there. So thanks again. Thank you for inviting me down. All yours. Thanks. We have lots of walks going. Please sign up. Please volunteer for the summit. We need lots of people. And you can scan that QR code tonight. I'll get you right to it. Great. We'll have lots of food next time for our hybrid meeting. Benjamin Van Doren uh, will be on Zoom with us, but we will be in the room. See you all next month, if not sooner. <laughs> <laughs>